Good morning. Make sure I'm Can you all hear? Ah, oh, you can hear me now. Okay, good. Good morning. It's a pleasure to see all of you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you this morning here on this Lord's Day at Winfrey Church. We're pleased that you have come to be a part of the worship service this morning. We're especially pleased if you are uh, our guest this morning here in Winfrey. Uh, if this is not your regular place of worship, we're glad that you have uh, made this your place of worship on this day. And so we're grateful you're here. Uh, you have already seen a number of announcements that have been flowing on the screens and you can uh, be apprised of all the things that are happening in the life of the church. When I went through the announcements this morning, uh, in your bulletin insert, it occurred to me that there were at least four different ways in which you can be involved in some type of service uh, through the life of Winfrey Church, everything from sharing candy for trunk or treat to filling uh, boxes for uh, Samaritan's Purse at Christmas time, uh, hurricane assistance, uh, etc. So many ways in which you can be of service in the life of the church. And I hope you will uh, look at uh, your announcements and keep aware of that and be involved as you have opportunity. One of the special guests that we have with us today in worship is Paul Honecker. Paul Honecker is uh, uh, 38 years, uh, served as minister of music at Bonaire Church in this community. Uh, Paul it continues to be a director of choral music. Uh, he directs the Ovation Chorus that does a couple of different concerts uh, each year to large, large uh, crowds. And he also directs handbells over at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. So we are, uh, whoops. Okay, here we are, okay. Well, it obviously didn't want me to say anything else about Paul Honecker uh, this morning. Uh, I, was, I was gonna, you know, say a lot of things, but uh, the most important thing I can say about Paul is Paul is my friend. And I've known Paul for many years and he and his wife Linda uh, are members at River Road Church uh, where I was pastor for uh, a number of years, and so we get to see them on a regular basis. And Paul is a gifted musician. He has led people in this community for many years. And Paul, we're grateful, wherever you are, you're in the pit. Uh, we are grateful that you're with us and helping lead us in worship today. May we join our hearts together to God in prayer. Creator God, your majesty is all around us and the beauty of the world. And so this morning we praise you for the lovely sun rising in the clear blue sky, for yellow leaves, for red and golden apples, for orange pumpkins and sunny shaped uh, gourds, for the cold that breaks through the summer heat, for all of these things we are grateful. And we thank you for the changing loveliness that quickens our senses and for allowing us to live in such a beautiful, beautiful world. May our worship this morning reflect our gratitude for who you are and for all that you have done and are doing for us through Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord today? Just love seeing all of you here. And thank you for those of you at home that are joining in. So, will you turn in your hymnals to hymn number 382, Serve the Lord with Gladness. So I hope I'm passing along that gladness to you. So, hymn 382, let's stand as we sing. reading from the Old Testament. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Serve the Lord with fear and cele celebrate his rule with trembling. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. I'll be reading from Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37. Jesus and his disciples came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 disciples and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking them in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, 
but the one who sent me. You stand as we sing. Now, if you will turn in your hymnals to page 524, 524, you will find our responsive reading and the next hymn we're going to sing. So once you arrive there, please join me in the responsive reading. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen? Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Seek ye first.
Join me in prayer, please. In the midst of all of our asking and seeking and knocking, O oh God, we pray that we might be open to receive all of the many gifts that you have given to us. And then in gratitude, we pray that we might use these gifts in ways to advance the work of your kingdom. We pray for the gifts and those who give them this day, that they might be multiplied to your glory. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Don Henshaw was a man that established a very lucrative and uh, beneficial publishing company many years ago. It is a company that continues to thrive, publishing the majority of their works for church and sacred works. When Don Henshaw himself passed away in July 1997, the composer, Mark Hayes, wrote this about this piece we're about to sing. I was deeply saddened. 
He was not only one of my first publishers, but also a dear friend. The Fellowship of American Baptist Musicians, with which Don had a special relationship, approached me about writing a choral anthem in his memory. I had no words to memorialize him. Sorry. It felt like an impossible task. I contacted my good friend and seasoned lyricist, John Parker, and asked for his help. He wrote an outstanding text based on passages from Ecclesiastes 1 and 12, which explores the transience and vanity of life as expressed by Solomon. I set the first half of this anthem in a wandering, searching mode, evoking the restlessness of the lyrics. As the phrase, all is empty, all is vain, lingers in the air, I introduce the answer to all the previous questions. That answer being, to love our God is the reason we live. To love our God, the highest call.
Thank you, choir. Thank you, Paul, for leading us in music today. When last we left the disciples and Jesus, they were on the road moving southward from Caesarea Philippi down to Jerusalem for the Passover. And we find this uh, lesson in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 35 and reading through verse 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, Master, we should like you to do us a favor. What is it you want me to do, he asked. They answered, grant us the right to sit in state with you, one at your right and the other at your left. Jesus said to them, you do not understand what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said, the cup that I drink you shall drink and the baptism I am baptized with you shall be your baptism. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. It is for those to whom it has already been assigned. When the other 10 heard this, they were indignant with James and John. Jesus called them to him and said, you know that in the world the recognized rulers lord it over their subjects and their great men make them feel the weight of authority. That is not the way with you. Among you, whoever wants to be great must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the willing slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to surrender his life as a ransom for many. We Americans have short attention spans. We prefer our explanations to be brief and to the point. And this preference has given rise to a couple of phenomena. One of the phenomena is the elevator speech. The elevator speech is a concise pitch in which you introduce yourself or you promote a product, you advertise a business, or you explain a personal philosophy. You write the speech very carefully, you rehearse it and memorize it, and then you deliver it in about the time it takes to go from the first floor to the fourth or fifth floor on an elevator. Because that's all the time that someone is going to give you to hear you out. Sermons, unfortunately, are not elevator speeches. <laughs> The second in, uh, phenomenon is uh, the bumper sticker that we affix onto the back bumper of our automobiles. And on the bumper sticker, you craft uh, something of your philosophy, your own idea, something you would like to say to others who happen to be following you in traffic. And often those bumper stickers express a theological idea, bumper sticker theology. Lord, keep one hand on my shoulder and the other hand over my mouth. That's a bumper sticker that many of us could afford to put on our cars. Another one, Jesus died to take away your sins, not your mind. And then one that I find unsettling, Lord, save me from your followers. Well, it didn't surprise me a few years ago when Christian Century Magazine invited several authors to summarize 
the Christian message in seven words or less. Boil it all down to its essence, its lowest common denominator. And so if see if you can capture in seven words or less the essence of what Christianity is all about. Craig Barnes, who was then the newly elected president at Princeton Theological Seminary, said it in four words. We live by grace. One of his professors, a New Testament professor, Beverly Gaventa, said, in Christ, God's yes defeats our no. Donald Schreiber, who had been president at Union Theological Seminary in New York, said it this way, divinely persistent God really loves us. Martin Marty, American professor, uh, uh, University of Chicago, said God, through Jesus Christ, welcomes you anyhow. And then Brian McLaren, a minister and a leader in the emergent church said, in Christ, God calls all to reconciliation. Well, an interesting thought experiment and I hope you won't do it now, but an interesting thought experiment would be for you to take your understanding of the Christian message and attempt to digest it down to seven words or less. From time to time, it is helpful for us to simplify, to take the, the broad view of things and to ask what this thing called Christianity is all about. Well, I think the place to begin understanding what Christianity is all about is to ask what Jesus is all about. And here in our lesson this morning, we get a, an increasingly clear, clearer picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do. They're on the way to Jerusalem. And there's plenty of time on the journey, and so they're conversing about things, and Jesus is schooling his disciples as they walk along. Unfortunately, as he is talking more and more about his own life's purpose and his task, the disciples mostly don't understand. And the reason they don't understand is because they're caught up in their own sense of, of what is important to them. So, Jesus deepens what he says to them. He says that when he arrives in Jerusalem, he will be betrayed and arrested and tried, and he will be killed. And James and John, who are listening to what Jesus is saying, interrupts him. And here's how they follow up on that, that, mo that dark, dark statement that Jesus is making to them. Uh, uh, Jesus, will you do us a favor? And Jesus says, what would you like? And they say, well, we would like to be one on the right and one on the left when you get into your administration. There's another perfect bumper sticker that if James and John were driving and you could put this bumper sticker on the back of their car, it would read like this, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> Little wonder then that the 10 other disciples are indignant when they hear what James and John are asking for. So Jesus has attempted to describe his mission, and the 12 are really just blind to what Jesus is talking about. The assumption here, I think, is that like James and John, so are we. We tend to miss the point. Sometimes we're a little dense, we're a little clueless, and often because we are self-absorbed. 
One of my favorite cartoons or cartoonists was a man named Doug Marlette. Doug Marlette drew political cartoons for the Charlotte Observer and then also uh, for the Boston Globe. But he also drew some very pointed uh, religious cartoons. His favorite character was a man named Reverend Will Be Dunn. <laughs> Reverend Will Be Dunn one day is standing in front of his congregation in one of the cartoons. He's looking out and the faces of his congregation as I'm doing now. And he is announcing that beautiful statement that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. And then he looks and he looks and he adds, we're definitely talking dim bulbs here. <laughs> it applies perfectly to James and John and the disciples who aren't getting who Jesus is and what Jesus that there's a feeling that uh, uh, they are entitled. Sometimes we, we feel like we're entitled. We come, we live in a prosperous nation, and because of that, we often feel like we are entitled. Most of the world around us pays six or eight dollars for a gallon of gas, and we get upset when we pay three dollars a gallon. Most of the world lives on 1,500 calories or less a day, and we want to have 1,500 calories at every meal. And so Jesus says, He doesn't, you, you guys don't know what you're asking uh, when He speaks to James and John. To, too often we expect something that doesn't really match up with the mission and task of Jesus. So here this morning, Jesus enunciates very clearly in the final verse of our lesson exactly what his task, his life's purpose, his mission is. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here he is stating very concisely his task and our task. Fred Craddock, a wonderful New Testament scholar and preacher, wrote a little commentary on this particular lesson. And in that, he describes uh, Jesus' purpose in seven words, to serve, to die, and to set free. To serve. If the church today has not fully embraced Jesus' mission to serve the world, and I don't think we have completely, then it's for one of two reasons. One reason we haven't embraced Jesus' mission of service completely is because we've not fully understood it. We've been too focused on what we think the mission ought to be. We, we are so plugged in to our desire to exercise political dominance in our society that sometimes we believe that the mission of Jesus was to exercise political domination over the culture in which we live. There's not a shred of evidence in the New Testament that that's what Jesus wanted to do. That's not his task. The second reason we haven't fully embraced this servant role of the church is because we have understood it. The ministry of servanthood can be unpleasant. It can be unglamorous. We can be called upon to do hard things in a culture that is not always appreciative of what we are trying to do when we serve uh, them. And so Jesus reminded them that the person who finds his life will lose it, and the one who loses his life for his sake will find it. So Jesus is calling us to live downward, to live for others rather than ourselves to serve. 
Secondly, to die. You remember last Sunday's lesson, we were talking about the rich man that Jesus spoke to, and in that lesson, Jesus concludes by talking with the disciples and he offers them a promise. He said, if you give yourselves over fully to God, then God uh, will provide you a hundredfold uh, of all that you've given up. And he starts listing the things, the hundredfold, but then he adds the words with persecutions. So Jesus never promises us that we would be free from pain or sacrifice or even loss in the service of the kingdom. When he was dean of the chapel at Duke University, Will Willimon on one occasion was lamenting to a group of students uh, that not more students came to chapel services uh, at the Duke Chapel on Sundays. And one co-ed spoke up, Dr. Williman, she said, I think I may know why the attendance is so slim. Why, he asked. And she replied, Duke is a very selective school and the students who come here are really bright. Most of them are smart enough to realize if they gave their life to Christ, it might make their lives more difficult. Then she added, I think it's amazing that you get as many students to come to Jesus as you do. And so it is often when we give our lives to Christ, it does complicate the life that we live. And then the third part of the task is to set free. Jesus said he's going to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you know what a ransom is? A ransom is something that you give in order to gain someone's release. Jesus doesn't spell out fully what he means by this idea of ransom. But there is, a, is something about that that says to me, that his life and his death achieves freedom for us. There is a liberating dimension to what Jesus did for us. And that squares exactly with what Jesus talked about in his very first sermon at the synagogue at Nazareth. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach uh, the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release of the captives. So Jesus' ministry and our ministry by extension is to liberate people from all of the things that bind them in a vice-like grip. Throughout my years in ministry, I've come to understand that most of us in one way or another, are bound by something. Some people are bound by regrets over some deed that they did in the past. Some are bound by anxieties about the prospect of something they're facing in the future. Some are bound by habits that they simply cannot break. Some are bound by relationships that they cannot escape. Some are bound by necessities that they feel compelled that they have to be doing day by day. And I think all of us at one time or another are bound by unfulfilled dreams and unrealized hopes. We all need to, to get that sense of freedom. And I don't know of anything that is more freeing than the idea, the notion of grace that you are loved and you are forgiven and that in Christ, even though you don't deserve it, even though you cannot purchase it, you have received this freedom and this welcome and this love that God offers so abundantly. It is by this grace of the Lord Jesus 
that we have been set free. And our Lord invites us to be a part of that, not just to receive it, but to share it with others. What's our task? Threefold, to serve, to die, and to set free. You have given the task that you have given to us and help us day by day to embrace them and to find ways that we can use our talents, our abilities to fulfill them. Through Christ we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our hymn of commitment and invitation. It's an opportunity for you to respond to the grace that you have received in Christ to make a first-time commitment to Christ as your Savior and Lord to, to enter into the fellowship and ministry of the Winfrey Church in, in any way that we receive members. We're going to sing our hymn, Jesus, I Come, number 439. And as we sing, if you have a decision that you need to make public today, I invite you to come. May we stand. I hope that you have found God's presence in a powerful way in the moments that we have spent here through the music, through the prayers, through the, to the message. And, and I hope that you will, uh, before you leave, take a moment to greet those people who are near you and welcome them to the worship service here at Winfrey Church. Let's bow for our closing prayer. And now for the, maybe the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you all both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.